Coming up on Tech News Today, Pinterest wants your travel money. Acer eliminates their CEO after just two weeks. And Windows phones march to victory. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, November 21st, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT11. And by Stamps.com. Start using your time more effectively with Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. To get this special offer, go to Stamps.com now, click on the radio microphone, and enter TNT. That's Stamps.com. Enter TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Isaac Turr. And I'm emergency Jason Alex Gumpel. Asleep in case at the wheel. of emergency, do not break Alex Gumpel, but do ask him to fill in for Jason. I hope, hope Jason feels better. He's fighting a little bug. But we still have the top technology news for you, starting with the top 10 of the day in the News Fuse. Acer announced it has elected founder Stan Shi as the new chairman and interim president of the company. Two weeks ago, current president Jim Wong was named to take over the CEO role from resigning CEO JT Wang. Instead, not only Wang, but also Jim Wong will step down and the position of CEO will be abolished. Co-founder George Wang will also return to the company on Xi's team. Acer has had several quarters of disappointing results. November 5th, Xi and George Wang headed a committee to determine the future of the company. I guess we know what it is now. Pinterest has released a new set of tools for users to help them explore and share the things around them. At an event with about 150 pinners at Pinterest headquarters in San Francisco, CEO Ben Silberman announced the company would introduce new ways to plan trips. The new product is called Place Pins, and it's designed to help users provide a visual guide to finding places to go and things to explore and then go back over them later. It uses the Foursquare API to help pinners explore the world. They're called pinners, not like Pinteresters? They're called pinners. Pinners, okay. Yeah. A California startup, Katiba, just announced its Yield Jet, which it calls the world's first inkjet printer engineered from the ground up for OLED mass production. Now, typically, OLED TVs are built using vacuum evaporation, which can be inefficient. Now, the Yield Jet prints the LEDs in a pure nitrogen environment, and it coats glass in a uniform way. Katiba suggests its techniques could bring down the pricing of OLED TVs. Microsoft has added an online store to its Don't Get Scroogled site, selling shirts, hats, and mugs with various anti-Google messages on them. As an example, you can get a shirt or a mug, actually, that has the Chrome logo and the words, Keep Calm While We Steal Your Data. What better way to protest the data collecting habits of one mega corporation than to give your credit card shipping address to another mega corporation, both of whom share data with the NSA? Mm. I don't even. Southwest Airlines is the first U.S. airline to provide the option of gate-to-gate -gate Wi-Fi internet service. Yes! That's because yeah. it uses a satellite technology that differs from air-to-ground technology used by GoGo, -Go, which you might use on Virgin America flights, for example, GoGo -Go in-flight Wi-Fi, which powers in-flight Wi-Fi for most other airlines, not just Virgin. Southwest has Wi-Fi on 435 of its planes using a satellite-based system from Global Eagle Entertainment's in-flight subsidiary, Row 44. The FAA now, of course, allows the use of phones and tablets during takeoff and landing. That was after an October 31st ruling. Windows Phone just landed some high-profile apps. First up is Waze, the social traffic app from Google. The app gives you pretty much the same feature set you'd see on the iOS version. There's also a new official Instagram app, which is in beta. The app does not the app does support photo upload, but you can't use the camera within the app itself. Additionally, Instagram for Windows Phone doesn't record or upload videos. 
HBO Go's iOS and Android apps both can stream to Google's Chromecast device starting today. That brings the official Chromecast app compatibility tally to seven, counting Pandora, Hulu Plus, Netflix, YouTube, the Chrome browser itself, and Google Play Video. It also means those restrictions your cable company puts on devices, uh, which devices can stream HBO Go, just will appear more ridiculous now. One of the original architects of the internet, Vince Cerf, is reminding everybody that privacy is... It's a pretty new concept. He says, quote, privacy is something which has emerged out of the urban boom coming from the Industrial Revolution. This, of course, Vince Cerf is Google's chief internet evangelist, lead engineer on the Army's early 1970s internet prototype, ARPANET. As a result, Cerf says, quote, privacy may actually be an anomaly. He told this uh, to a gathering of folks at the Federal Trade Communication and, quote, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be interested in privacy. I'm suggesting to you that it's an accident in some respect of the urban revolution. Oops, privacy. I just got privacy all over Whoops, me. Whoops, we've got privacy. <laughs> LG now admits its televisions were sharing data on the channels you watched and file names you streamed using their smart TVs even when the setting was disabled. The company uses the data to serve ads on the TV's apps. LG regrets concerns the reports have caused. They're sorry you got mad, in other words. They reassured you that the data, while transmitted, was never stored. It's not personally identifiable. And they promise a firmware update that will actually disable data transmission when the setting is, turns it off. It'll be a sad day on December 20th, 2013, because that's the day the music dies. At least for Winamp, AOL announced that Winamp.com and its web services will no longer be supportive pa supported past December 20th. I guess they'll be supportive in other ways. Totally different <laughs> word. Uh, the Winamp media player will no longer be available for download as well. AOL bought Winamp way back in June 1999 for $80 million. Wow. The llamas everywhere uh, are very happy. That's a lot of money they at that point. They finally sit down. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. They're constantly improving their platform with the beautiful designs and the easy-to-use template and the 24-7 support and the mobile-ready responsiveness. Even their freaking code is beautiful. We all know Squarespace looks beautiful on the outside, but what's also amazing, if you haven't looked is that the code is elegant. Squarespace takes just as much pride in their back end as they do in their front end design. And it's search engine optimized. You make a site on Squarespace, your site's content's going to be crawled not just by Google. Of course, it's going to be crawled by Google, but Yahoo and Bing and Ask and all the other search engines. And you'll be able to rely on that. You won't have to go in and tweak settings and do all that stuff. They take care of that. Speaking of tweaking settings, they take care of hosting too. You're not going to have to worry about uptime, downtime, allocating the memory, bandwidth, and managing all that stuff. Squarespace takes care of that. It all starts at just $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. You can start a trial right now, and you don't even have to give them a credit card. So if you've been thinking, yeah, Tom, you keep telling me about the Squarespace thing. I've been meaning to go do it. Just do it. Just go do it. Start building a website. You can even import your old ones. So you see what it looks like in one of those beautiful Squarespace designs. And when you decide... To sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TNT11. That gets you 10% off and shows your support for Tech News Today at the same time. And yet we're hoping you'll show your support for Tech News Today because Squarespace has been such a great supporter of Tech News Today as well. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. All right, let's uh, let's pull up the old round table and plop it down and put some stories on it and talk about them. Joining us today, senior writer from CNET News, Stephen Shankland, live from Paris. How's it going, Stephen? Oh, it's going fabulously. I got a uh, bandwidth upgrade, so oh, life is great. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Uh, good old Paris bandwidth upgrade. Let's start. Uh, we should all go visit Stephen. And uh, Sarah, maybe we can plan the trip on Pinterest. I would love to. Paris is lovely in the winter. Actually, it's very cold. But a new product called Place Pins, I mentioned in the news views, is is uh, Pinterest's new way to say it's not just about scrapbooking. It's actually about planning something very specific, like a trip, for example. It's not just, you know, pictures of flowers or something for your home. It can actually be for travel as well. It's designed to help uh, Pinterest users provide a visual guide for themselves or others to find places to go and things to explore. So as a pinner, you can start planning a trip by creating a new board. It's based on location. And then you can add pins with locations to those boards. The tool is kind of neat because it incorporates both uh, maps 
and images, and then also relevant information to pins that, that you would add, and then allows uh, pinners to view places that they'd like to visit both online and then, of course, via Pinterest mobile apps, which are also quite good. You can keep track of places while you're on the go, and it works out pretty well because Pinterest Place Pins is using uh, Foursquare's API to determine your location. So if you're adding something on the go or you're looking to explore something that somebody else may have added while you're on the go, Pinterest now is able to geolocate you and offer up suggestions. So maybe you're in Paris and somebody has a really great board of places in this particular neighborhood uh, to go get a crepe. Uh, there's a great little crepe. Well, anyway, uh, if you're in that area, then that might get served up to you via Pinterest. Now, what's interesting to me is I think this is a great idea, particularly because Pinterest is on the rise. People love Pinterest, but it's not necessarily been used as an on the go. Oh, let me check Pinterest to get some ideas and let me add to the database on Pinterest as I move along. Makes a lot of sense to me. But does it start to really compete with some of these apps that have moved into the exploration model? I mean, Foursquare is a great example of kind of a pivot from a company where it's less about check-ins and more about exploring the world around you. Foursquare is not a visual app, though. It, it never really has been. It's almost cartoonish, really, in a way, if you compare it to something like Pinterest. Stephen, what do you think? I think it's a really smart idea. So for, partly for the reason you mentioned, which is that it, it gets you you know, a new reason to be active on Pinterest. You know, it, it, it increases the things you can do with it and it makes it more lively as opposed to, you know, something you check after the kids go to sleep, you might check it all through the day. So, you know, I think that's the first thing and that's the most important thing. But more broadly, I think it's really interesting that what we're getting through Pinterest and a whole lot of other services is kind of this annotated, uh, you know, this online uh representation of reality that is generated by everybody who uses Pinterest or Wave or Foursquare or, or you know, geotags photos on Flickr. We're kind of getting this electronic overlay to the real world. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about augmented reality and most of it is a lot of hot air at this, at this point. But, you know, you build up enough database of what's really going on in the world. And after a few years, you know, AR becomes it becomes real because you have actual real data on everything around you. So I, I think it's a fascinating trend. And when you have, you know, millions of users doing the hard work for you, as opposed to, you know, like Google Maps driving cars everywhere, that's very expensive. But when you have millions of users doing the work for you, that's something you can do, you know, very cost effectively. So I think this is fascinating. It it's also of, an interesting partnership too, right? I mean, every one of these pictures that I'm looking at, I'm looking at a, a one that was created by Anthony Coithra called Downtown LA Renaissance. And it's just a bunch of great places to go that you might not have heard of in downtown Los Angeles. And every one of these pictures says from Foursquare, right? This is this is good for Foursquare. In fact, I wonder if there's a little payment going back and forth. Also, you're right about Foursquare not being that visual, Sarah, but they've been trying to. Every time I launch Foursquare, there's always a picture taken by somebody shown there. Maybe they're going to, pull some of these Pinterest photos over to their app as well, do a little sharing there. That would be interesting. But Steven, I think you totally nailed it. Like imagine this thing on Google Glass when you're walking around and it's like, hey, that way, there's the coffee shop. This is what it looks like. Here's the menu. I mean, this this is just the beginning of something that could be really cool as AR. And especially because Pinterest has, I mean, it has the user base. There's so many people using it. And it also gets around how some apps, for example, Foods Body in the past, it was all about, hey, explore and find food that's nearby you, but maybe a little limiting. With Pinterest, it's like, it's travel-based. So yeah, I'm in downtown LA. I might get hungry. I might want to, you know, uh, go shopping at some cool store that I've never heard of, check out the hotel down the street. It's a little bit more all-encompassing that I think will appeal to people more. Yeah, the visual presentation of Pinterest is a totally different thing than Foursquare. A Foursquare or Yelp, you have a lot of these lists, or you can do the exploration kind of thing, but uh, it also gives Pinterest somewhat of a direction because you could pin pretty much anything to any board. A lot of people use it for shopping, a lot of wish lists, those kinds of things. But to say, hey, look, we're actually going to make it easy for traveling. Now you actually have this idea of what else could I do with Pinterest? Because if you didn't have an idea and you're like, okay, so you're pinning a bunch of stuff. That's great. What am I going to use it for? To give it somewhat of a, of a focus, at least to people who might not be familiar with Pinterest, they might actually go to use this because, because you are getting this really nice visual representation of data that otherwise you'd be swiping through picture and picture and picture and picture Foursquare. Uh, I think it's a really okay. smart deal. I, I got I to gotta rain on the parade just a little bit here because, you know, we've seen this with Google Maps. This is a channel that's very susceptible to spam. 
mm-hmm. you know, people want to promote their businesses or, you know, do whatever nefarious thing to game the system. This is the kind of thing where you can, you know, you have to monitor everything. It's always the bugaboo of user generated content. And then the other issue is, you know, uh, th- that's great that, you know, there's a good guide to LA or New York or Paris or something like that. But, you know, there are going to be thousands of people putting this stuff together. So you're going to have to have a pretty good system to, uh, you know, call call the, the, the direct. And so you can find the good stuff. And, you know, if you're just following a particular person you like, that's a good way to do it. But, you know, there's got to be some kind of mechanism where, you know, people can upvote stuff they like or, uh, you know, some, some way that you can sift through the chaff. Because when you go to Manhattan, you know, you can bet they're just going to be, there's going to be pins on everything left and right. So, uh, you know, I think that's, that's going to be kind of, you know, potentially really noisy information channel. So you gotta, you gotta sift it somehow. And it seems like Pinterest actually wants to make some money off that. If you look at their example page, it's all brands in there. And I'm sure they can come up with some way to charge people to rise above the clutter there uh, in some way. You know who else needs some focus is Acer, as we heard. They've got a shakeup. Uh, Acer founder Stan She getting rid of the CEO position, taking over the presidency temporarily and becoming chairman of the board. He and co-founder George Wang had uh, headed up a committee November 5th when they announced what was going to be the new CEO. Uh, and they've decided, you know what? We got to take over. Stan Shee said in a statement, due to the situation that now faces Acer and my personal social responsibilities, I must stand up and take the reign without salary. So George Wang joins the management team, Stan Shee running the show. Acer has been the number two PC maker at some times. Right now they're the number four and falling. Uh, they're a tablet maker, but they're number five and falling. Stephen, if Stan Shee came to you for your opinion on what to do with Acer, what would you tell him? Oh, Lord. it That is such a, a sticky wicket. I think they're doing a couple things right. I think Chromebooks are an interesting new growth area, and their first-generation product was really a dog, but they're showing some promise with, with newer models. Uh, and, of course, you know, the tablet push, I think, has probably got to be an area where they need to concentrate but that's so crowded there's just no easy answer for these guys they got strong when all the r&d was done for them by microsoft and by intel and so it was this game of who could optimize a production line the best you know they did real work a lot you know being a, a pc manufacturer takes a lot of real engineering skill so i don't you know I don't begrudge them that, but we've kind of moved on from that era to, uh, you know, a time when people are buying stuff that's uh, with, with hardware and software that's unified. If you look at what Samsung's trying to do with Tizen, you know, making its own operating system, that's really hard to do. And, you know, there's no easy way out for these guys. They're, they have to still keep on pushing the PC business, even though it's such a doggy market. And I think they have to push into the new mobile market. It's, you know, there's no easy way out for them, uh, but that's what they've got to do. I think Acer's got a bunch of handsets. They're just not in the U.S. Uh, and I think their partnership with Google to be one of the few devices that in the Play Store, right now it's all sold out, I think, the, uh, the, the Acer C7. I think that might be the smartest bet for them in general. Being another company that makes a Windows tablet or a Windows device, that is a pretty crowded market when it comes to this. And the idea that they're somewhat commoditized is, is an issue, right? What's going to make you stand out? ASUS has been doing a really good job with their products, making them stand out, having different form factors, the Transformers, Lenovo doing something similar with the Yoga. Acer's kind of sticking to its to its strengths, you know, making laptops, making tablets. But uh, it, it's an interesting move to see the shift up top, and that's actually going to yield any differences because it's not like it's, Acer's is in this like death spiral like we've been seeing other companies. So if this keeps them go, uh, going from further down on the, on the numbers from 4 to 10 or something when it comes to top PC makers, that could be a big deal. But I don't know if they're in dire straits just yet. You know, a company that's coming out of dire straits in the phone handset making business is actually Microsoft. Windows Phone, possibly, uh, definitely, actually, you could call a viable number three to Android and iOS or, or Samsung and Apple, depending on whether you want to look at the actual manufacturer of the handsets or the operating system. Iaz, what, what are we talking about today? Is it just the add, addition of these apps like Instagram? There are apps and there's, there's, some, there's been some shifts in Windows Phone. So there was a revised Google application that came out. It works similar like the one on Android and iOS, a lot more voice control. And yesterday they got uh, Waze and Instagram. Uh, so the Instagram app is, before that you had to use the unofficial one. The first reports claimed Instagram, the app wouldn't let you shoot or upload pics or videos 
But CNET reported, after playing around with Instagram for Windows Phone, we found you can take photos and post them. Uh, in their review, they call it a convoluted process because you have to take a photo in the camera app, then upload it to Instagram as opposed to going directly through there. Uh, the application is not beta, though. Uh, Instagram says users can upload photos. Uh, you can't shoot photos in the app itself, like I just mentioned. Just uh, read my note again. Sorry about that. The app is still in beta. You can't record videos. So if you like videos, you're not going to be doing that with Instagram. No geotagging. No photo map. You can't tag people. So they have Instagram, but kind of. Uh, don't forget beta. And Windows Phone numbers were out thanks to uh, Kantar. Italy, Windows Phone's 13.7%. Great Britain, 11.4%. U.S., 4.6%. Uh, China, 2.5% of the market is Windows Phone. YouTube, guess what? Coming to Microsoft products, but not Windows Phone. It's coming to Xbox One. So Google and Microsoft can work together. Uh, obviously, they have Waze on Windows Phone. They have YouTube on Xbox, but they can't get YouTube official on Windows Phone. The BBC had an interview with Joe Belfiore. He asked, where do you want Windows Phone numbers to be a year from now? And here's what he had to say. You know, I don't like predicting what our numbers are going to be. It's very Where would you hard want to them say. to be? Well, I, I, think that, I think that most people would agree that today we are the number three smartphone ecosystem. Um, the, the numbers are supporting it. The behavior of software developers is supporting it. Albeit what, a distant third, though. Would it's you a distant that? third, admittedly, but certainly number three. And if you talk to most of our mobile operator partners, you talk to consumers in general, people want three strong players in the industry because competition is healthy for everyone. So we got, we got Joe Belfiore not exactly screaming like, I want to have 100% and I want all Windows Phone world. Stephen, do you think that Microsoft could be content being the third player in the mobile market as opposed to being the market leader? Content? No, it will never be content being the third, third, third player. I, I think that it might have to adjust to that. Uh, it's certainly not going to change anytime soon. Uh, it's not going to be content. It's not going to, um, you know, be complacent about it. It's going to fight tooth and nail, which I think it has been. Uh, the problem is that there, you know, there's there's such a, there's such a virtuous cycle between application development, handset development, operating system development. And Android and iOS are both in that feedback loop where, you know, development here leads to development there, leads to popularity with customers here, leads to excitement by the handset makers or the carriers there. And so that is, you know, spun up. And it's just, it's really hard to get, uh, you know, in an ecosystem that excited and uh, about yet another operating system. Fundamentally, I, Microsoft, you know, it's got a lot of things that's, that are nice about Windows Phone. So, you know, it's a credible operating system, but it's still, it's fundamentally, it's not this, you know, paradigm shift. It's not this spectacularly different thing from Android and iOS. So if you're a carrier or a handset maker, th there's just not a huge incentive to, to try to, uh, you know, build this new ecosystem to train all your retail sales staff to get the developers on board. It's a lot of work. You don't have to do it with iOS. You don't have to do it with Android. So, uh, you know, it's 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 going to be really hard for Microsoft, but will they be content with that position? Certainly not. I do think that the, the the operating system is maturing. The app situation is getting better slowly, but it's it's never going to be it's never going to be one of these things. I shouldn't say never, but you know, not for the next couple of years. Certainly, it's not going to be a certain situation where the developers think, okay, I need to launch iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. You know, within within the first month. I mean, you you still see Android versions of big apps showing up months or years later even. so Which is very it's surprising at this point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, you still, I run across this all the time, and I know it goes, there are Android-first apps and, you know, that are that are not necessarily iOS-first, but so many of uh, apps that are you know, very interesting that I find on iOS say, Android in the works, we're working on it, but it wasn't, it wasn't in, you know, the first push. Windows Phone, rarely mentioned. The curiosity for me and is Android, that... And Android apps are uh, they're often you know clearly a, a second tier effort too. You know, I was playing this Ken Ken you know logic puzzle game a couple days ago. Oh, it was, uh, it was so laggy, and I thought, well, I'll try it on on my iPad on iOS, and it was smooth and polished and beautiful. Oh, that's great. Uh, you know, I'm never going to play it on the Android tablet again because it was just so much nicer on iOS. Smug Mug released its Camera Awesome app last week, and you know it's. They only released it for a few Android phones, you know, the really popular ones, because they just can't deal with the fragmentation issues. Uh, you know, the Android fans, I like Android. I use it a lot. Uh, the Android fans uh, 
downplay the fragmentation issue, but every time I talk to a developer, it really is a pain to deal with all the different phones, especially the more sophisticated your software is, the more a problem it is. If you're just you know, drawing a few text boxes and text input fields, it's not a big deal. But if you're doing a high performance uh, you know, racing game app or something like that, then it's tricky. So, uh, And then you multiply that problem by you know, a factor of five to deal with the Windows phone uh, differences. And it's just not an easy sell. And Microsoft's about to change the ground rules by acquiring the Nokia handset business uh, sometime after the first of the year. It's been approved by the board. Uh, so that's that's all set to go, just needs the approvals. And and that that will affect how, how this system has been working up to now. Let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show. With the holidays almost here, you don't have time to go to the post office. I was just driving around the other day, traffic parking it's packed everywhere we, we, we drove around for for oh, i don't want to say hours but it felt like hours trying to find a parking space at the mall everybody's mailing holiday gifts and packages here's what you do for that though don't leave the house for that Use Stamps.com instead. With Stamps.com, you can avoid all the hassle of going to the post office during the busy holiday season because everything you would do at the post office, you can do right from your desk. You can buy and even print official U.S. postage. I like getting, uh, I get postage from some of my friends who use stamps.com and it's like Scott Johnson's got his own little illustrations. He's got his own stamps on there. You use your own computer, your own printer, print postage for any letter or package the instant you need it. And then the guy, the mailman comes, you know, the mail person comes to your house already. They'll pick it up. Easy, convenient. I use stamps.com actually to get stuff for review for before you buy from Twit. It's easy to just print the label and then hand it to the post. I don't have to leave the house. Right now, get this special offer when you use our promo code TNT. No risk trial, plus a $110 bonus offer, including a digital scale and up to $55 free postage. Don't wait. Go to stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in TNT. That's stamps.com. Enter TNT. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Go do it now. All right, Google uh, launching a newsstand competitor. I've been playing around with this too this morning, Sarah. What do you think so far? Yeah, so anybody who says, Ugh, everything always comes to iOS first, <laughs> obviously it doesn't hang there out with go. Google products very often. No, the uh, Google Play newsstand is available now for Android, and it's an app that's a combination of current Google Play Magazines app, which is available in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and Australia, and kind of morphs with Google Currents, which has been around a while. You could think of it as Google's Flipboard competitor. It's very similar in that way where it is sort of designed to help you make your own magazine and sort of get, sort of get uh, uh, smarter over time based on what you like to read. Play Newsstand will feature about 1,900 free and paid publications, combination of both. The selection is stuff like, you know, big newspapers like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Vanity Fair, Wired, some free blogs, some news sites that have partnered with Google. So it's a real mixture of kind of the old... Uh, the old guard of journalism and new stuff. Uh, the company says it puts the news that you care about most front and center, presents stories that interest you based on your tastes. The more you read, the better it will get. Now, Google does offer its Currents app as a standalone app for iOS. That's something that I've been using for quite a while. And it's kind of interesting because uh, Yahoo had a, another competitor. Again, there's their all the companies kind of have their Flipboard competitors and um, decided to to do away with that. AOL's was kind of, I don't want to say dead on arrival, but never went anywhere. But Google's definitely thinking that this is this is a product that they want to keep refining. And with the new stand for Android, it's not only refined, but it's kind of expanded into something that's not unlike the new stand for iOS. Uh, so, and by the way, the iOS app is, is apparently going to be updated to the newsstand version that is available for Android uh, early next year. Stephen, do you think, is there, is there any confusion between iOS newsstand and, and the Google newsstand? Or is, do, do, you, do you like this new product? Yeah, I, I find it hard to get that excited about these things. And, you know, I, I shouldn't say that because my salary is paid by a news organization, right? So obviously I should think this is wonderful. Uh, sometimes these these apps kind of have a feel to me of, oh, you know, we're making the publishers so angry. We have to throw them a bone. And, you know, for my purposes, I, I just 
still rather generally read the news on the web because then you get those links and you can click those links. I love clicking those links to see what uh, you know the source material is or or something related. Um, I, I'd like I, I do think the apps are you know they're useful. There are a lot of Flipboard users in the world for sure, uh, but I, I guess. I, I still don't feel like these things are really exciting. I think they have to be there. And I think, you know, probably have, you know, reasonable usage, but it's just, it's hard for me to get excited about, uh, about them. I'm looking at my Nexus 7 right now. And I think what's most intriguing about this is thinking about it as newsstand, right? When you go to iOS and you see newsstand, you see a bunch of magazines and periodicals that you can buy and then download and read. This has got The Verge. It's got The Wall Street Journal. It's got The New York Times. I click The New York Times. I'm not buying anything. It just takes me to headlines. Right now, I'll have a chance for in-app purchases here. But it's kind of trying to be a little bit flipboard and a little bit uh, newsstand. They even have business, entertainment, sports, and technology, spelling out best there across the uh, the middle of it as well. And when I click into the technology, again, it's that kind of Pinteresty flipboard. We're going to show a big picture and the headlines. It's all the headlines I would expect there. So I don't know, maybe I will use this, but not as a newsstand per se. And maybe maybe it'll trick me into buying some kind of publication from somebody at some point. Okay. Well, why, I mean, why do you have to be tricked into it if you like it? Well, because I don't want to go and buy a publication and download it. But uh -huh. this is like, you don't have to buy anything. You just start reading it. And maybe the New York Times gets me like, hey, you want some more stories like this? Subscribe, right? Instead of taking me out of that mindset of buying first and then reading. You know what I'm saying? This design just screams this is going to be integrated into Google+, Plus. even the little the little tags that say health. I mean, when you do it on Google+, Plus, you have a little hashtag or something when it has a topic. I'm just wondering how this is going to integrate with that because this could add a nice visual layer to Google Plus, as well as if, you've interested, if you're interested in these stories, remember that whole, when Google Plus started, it was something called Sparks, mm -hmm. uh, this idea of that you could spark a conversation around something. I think this this presentation of, of the information is another, it's similar to Pinterest, very visual, very nice, and I've, I'm just waiting for it to get plusified, because it has to. All right, let's talk about privacy. Let's talk, uh, Vince Cerf is uh, talking to the Federal Trade Commission's Internet of Things workshop, and says, in a Q&A session afterwards, Privacy is something which has emerged out of the urban boom coming from the Industrial Revolution. Privacy may actually be an anomaly. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't be interested in privacy, but I am suggesting to you that it's an accident in some respect of the urban revolution. Uh, and, and actually, there's some great examples from Gregory Ferenstein over at TechCrunch about internal walls in homes not being common until the 19th century or public toilets uh, not having doors for the, the longest time. Even bedchambers were only really popular with the European wealthy in the 1600s. Uh, the right to privacy wasn't coined by Louis Brandeis uh, until 1890 and not recognized by the Supreme Court until 1967. Now, Surf's point is that transparency is something we're going to have to live through. And he said, we are going to live through situations where some people get embarrassed. Some people end up going to jail. Some other people have other problems as a consequence of some of these experiences. And he was talking less about the NSA stuff than you're in the background of somebody else's Facebook photo doing something you didn't realize was going to get captured and maybe is a little embarrassing. Stephen, you mentioned before the show Scott McNeely's famous quote uh, from a long time ago. You don't have any privacy. Get over it. I'm paraphrasing, of course. How much privacy no, was, should we expect on the Internet? That, that was a pretty – I think that's pretty much exactly what he said. Uh, he was being somewhat flippant, but uh, in any event, uh, I think that you should expect some privacy on the, the Internet. It, it might indeed be that privacy is an anomaly. Vint Cerf might be right about that. It's kind of a de depressing thought, but – uh, you know, there. I think there, there, there are two things that are different today versus you know when you're growing up in a village in the 19th century or something like that. You know, yes, you might not have had any privacy then, but the, the first thing that's different is now you don't have any privacy. But it's not just from the other 300 villagers; it's from seven billion people on the entire world. Uh, you know, that's a, a, a huge difference in 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 you know how you what you're willing to share instead of being visible to 300 people whom you know, you're visible to 7 billion people whom you definitely do not know or trust. Uh, it's a very different situation. The second thing that's different is that everything is recorded. So instead of just being fleeting memories and gossip uh, going around the village, it is, you know, recorded on Facebook or on Google or on, you know, some website. This is, or you know, even logged by the NSA. You know, there are all, all kinds of different places where this stuff gets recorded forever. So, 
you know, if you have privacy, maybe that keeps some of that from being recorded in the first place, or it gives you some control over how it's shared. I think that, you know, it's difficult to maintain privacy just because the, the information is so easy to copy and so easy to share and so easy to, to uh, analyze. But I think that we need to continue to work to actually have some privacy just because of the scale. You, you just can't function as a human being if everything is fully exposed to 7 billion people. And, you know, I think, you know, there may be not, maybe there wasn't so much privacy in your little village a few hundred years ago, but I still suspect there were things you wouldn't want to tell to some people, conversations you wanted to keep secret uh, for whatever reason, not just for criminals. You know, there's a lot about uh, human nature that uh, likes to, you know, be, be private. So I, I think Vint Cerf might be right or partly right, but I don't think that means we should be complacent and not have privacy. I think there's cert there's also behavior that, you know, changes the way that it's not the expectation of privacy, but, you know, for example, if I want to uh, record IM conversations, I can have all of that stuff just like hanging out in little files on my computer. And I just choose not to because it's like, eh, it's almost like I want it to seem like a conversation. And once it's done and the window closes, I'm not going to go back and pour over it over and over. That's just a choice that I make because I feel like it represents more of the natural way that humans communicate. And you've got something like Snapchat, which maybe acts a little bit more like even though it's obviously very hot and it's new and, and hip and cool and everything, it acts a little bit more like the way sharing would work if everything wasn't being documented and saved and categorized and put into folders and possibly leaked out to people and hurts others. So it's interesting to see what we're doing with privacy. I think most people understand that expectations of privacy really need to be lowered, but kind of how you use the tools is fascinating as well. Yeah, I think Surf is trying to say is that privacy has been at the highest that it's ever been in history. And now that we have the internet and it's lowering, it's not the end of the world. We've dealt with less privacy in the past, but we need to learn how to deal with it. He's not saying forget about privacy, not like McNeely. I think what he's saying is we, we have to come up with new ways of dealing with it, with new forms of transparency. It just means new rules. That, that seems to make sense for me. All right, last discussion story, Ayaz Akhtar, Intel, and why they're killing, it seems like, their TV service. Yeah, so Reuters has this report explaining what happened to Intel's TV service called OnQ. Uh, it turns out the decision to kill OnQ came from Intel's CEO, Brian Krasanich, who thought the company could not afford the distraction and expense, according to sources familiar with the decision. Uh, the Intel pop-up stores in New York, LA, and Chicago were supposed to serve as, as promotional places for Intel television. That makes a lot of sense now that I think about it. I don't know how we missed that. Now the store is going to have Ultrabooks and tablets, and Intel is going to fulfill its commitments to have those pop-up stores. Uh, Reuters sources say that OnQ's most likely buyer is still Verizon. All Things D reported the same thing a while ago. And the report has some or, uh, information about the origin of OnQ. Former BBC exec Eric Huggers pitched the idea, and the old CEO, Paul Odellini, saw an opportunity to diversify into a new consumer business. Now, Krasanich... Obviously, he didn't like Odellini's interest in Intel TV. Spent his first six months as CEO. He was focused on the declining PC business, the lack of progress of Intel in mobile. And uh, Huggers came close to finalizing deals, but they would require an upfront outlay of hundreds of millions of dollars. And people who've seen the prototypes of the, uh, of the set-top box, they said the UI was great. There was a lot of interesting stuff there. Steve, do you think that OnQ was a distraction? Should Intel have taken this crazy gamble into the consumer space? I think it was it was not foolish for them to take the crazy gamble. If you look at Intel's history, they they like to try new things. They often give things a three year shot. They they try it. They give it three years, and you know after the end of the second year, they just you know, make some decision about whether to double down or look for some kind of escape hatch. And you know I think this is one of these things that they tried and decided against the the bind that Intel is in. You know, they're used to being a brand name, Intel inside. People would buy computers based on Intel chips for the longest time. And what we're seeing with the mobile transformation is that processors are becoming a mere component. You know, you don't know who made the speakers in your mobile phone. You don't know who made the screen in your mobile phone. And in all likelihood, you don't know who made the processor in your mobile phone. And that's the, the future Intel is looking at. So it's looking for ways to actually preserve its brand with consumers. You see it moving into software here and there and into services like this TV thing. It's, I think part of a, a, a difficult process for Intel to, you know, 
be demoted to the ranks of somebody like you know Broadcom or Qualcomm. Very important companies, but the vast majority of consumers have never heard of them and probably never will. So you know if you're if you're in Intel, you've been left out of the mobile revolution. You're looking for some kind of alternative. It was it was you know not not a not a dumb idea to to experiment, but. Uh, I don't think it's their core competency, and it does not surprise me that it it flopped. When you get a new CEO, it's often you know a good time to have fresh eyes. You get uh, the old batch of yes men gets cleared out, the new batch of yes men uh, come in, and uh, you know something that doesn't look smart gets the axe. You know, the part of the Reuters story that made me sad, because I tend to agree with you, Stephen, that Kurzanich is probably doing the right thing, saying let's let's focus on what we're actually going to be good at rather than taking a high-flying risk right now. But there was a section of that Reuters story where they said Odellini was willing to commit cash to this, and they were they, they say in the story that they were going to be able to strike deals. They were just going to cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Now, that probably would have been bad for Intel. But as a consumer, I would love to see someone throw enough money at this problem to actually get us television over the I Internet. And so I'm a little disappointed that Intel didn't do that. But then if I was an Intel shareholder, which I'm not, I probably would not be disappointed at all. I think this is probably the right move. I mean, we've seen companies go from like being manufacturers of devices for other companies or providing components like Samsung provides displays plays for lots and lots of different companies, but they have managed to become a brand name that's actually like a premier brand at this point. Intel, if they'd made the gamble, yeah, Tom, I think you're totally right. I think the, the shareholders would be like, what are you doing? That's a lot of money. That's crazy. But if if this thing, if this, if they could differentiate what they were doing based on the user experience, which is kind of what Apple does in general. It's like, okay, well, we make similar hardware, but it's the UI that makes a difference. If that was a true differentiator, that would have been really interesting. And I'm curious if and when Verizon does buy this, uh, what this thing is going to look like in the long run. Because it, if it's if it's supposed to be what people say it is, it's supposed to be like one of the be better UIs that's existed for cable television. All right. We'll have to set that one on the credenza for now. We'll, we'll probably get back to it in, in another day. But let's fire up the randomizer. Randomizer. As straw poll today, and the winner with 55% of the vote was a new Chrome experience that's in partnership with the movie The Hobbit that lets you explore Middle Earth. I don't know if you guys have uh, played around with this. I was playing around with it yesterday afternoon. It's got all the music, all the characters, some clips. Uh, but then the cool part is once you've actually opened it up and played around, you can walk through Rivendell and the forest and, and, and various parts of Middle Earth. I, you know, even though the Hobbit movie may have disappointed me a little bit, I'm still a big fan. So I enjoyed this. I don't know about you know what, what did you guys think. Me? The voting on this one. There was another randomizer option for Sony's patenting a smart wig. Yeah. Okay, that's a wearable. That's crazy. That's Got random. Last place, I asked. Last Demar place. I'm yeah. shocked at this. This is amazing that you guys just want to look at Middle Earth and walk around in it, as opposed to wearing a wig that can work with you and tell you things. I mean, you won't wear glass on your face, but maybe you will wear a smart toupee. Anyway, that's a Jeez. whole Jeez. I thought we were supposed to celebrate the winner of the straw poll. I'm not. Okay. We're celebrating? Let me get the balloons. Wow. Somebody hates hobbits. Yeah, no right. idea. No, I like smart wigs because it's crazy. Or somebody loves wigs. That's cool. <laughs> Maybe she <somebody> loves wigs. <laughs> wig lover. Uh, wig lover actor. That's, That's what they kept calling me in high school. <laughs> wig lover. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> If you didn't, if you're not watching the video, you just missed the best joke of the whole show. Let's check the count. <laughs> Tomorrow, the 22nd of November, Nokia's Lumia 2520 tablet is available at AT&T for $399.99. So that's basically $400. Also tomorrow, the Xbox One is launching in its first 13 markets. Australia, Austria, Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Mexico, New Zealand, Spain, the UK, and the US of A. More markets to come in 2014. Let's finish up with an email. Incoming message. An email from the esteemed Nate Langson. He says, guys, you sort of asked on yesterday's show for my thoughts on UK websites we <laughs> being able to use .uk domains. My view is that it's a good thing overall. We currently also have .uk.com, which is just confusing. This simple .uk makes things easier for businesses to adopt without worrying users uh, will get confused. I also like that it brings us in line with other countries like Japan, which just has a .jp country TLD. Let's be honest, though. Most people are still going to just use .co.uk. Yeah, and they probably shouldn't give up those domain names. We should definitely ask for like more random opinions like, hey, you know, this looks like an opinion for Bill Gates. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder what uh, Paul Odellini would think about this. He's not doing anything anymore. He's got time to write in the show. Well, it's like when you're used to anything. I mean, even though it's like .co.uk, I mentioned it's like there's two periods in there. That just seems silly. If you're used to it enough, just a any change, even if it's supposed to make things easier, is not always... It doesn't always work that way, so yeah. I understand that. I guess some... it used to. It did. It did, used to seem very odd to me in 1996, but right. yeah, now nowadays it's just the way it normal. is. Well, that's it for this show. Uh, News.cnet.com is the place to keep up with the work of the fine Stephen Shanklin. Do you got anything uh, in particular going on over there, Stephen? You want to let us know about? Oh well, let's see. We got a story coming tomorrow on a company called uh, a company launching a new. Uh, photo book service, which is not that interesting in and of itself. There are plenty of photo book services, but it, what's interesting to me is it uses Google's Dart programming language, ah, which has been nice. kind of controversial in the web programming world, but it seems like we're, we've got some traction. It's catching on at least with some developers. So I uh, should put that Q&A up tomorrow. And uh, uh, also an interview with Brock Davis, the uh, internet's greatest artist. Oh, cool. Good stuff. Actually, I'm really interested in, in a good use of Dart. I've been waiting to see one of those, so I'll, I'll be checking that out. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us. Really appreciate it, man. You're welcome. Good to be here. Don't forget about our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, where you can have a say in what we talk about on the show. You can email us. Our email address is tnt at twit.tv. Give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash technewstoday. And, of course, get the podcast. Subscribe to all of that stuff. Get the show notes at twit.tv slash TNT. Hopefully, Jason will be better tomorrow. Sarah's off tomorrow. We haven't confirmed Darren. Maybe just me and I as. Who knows? Tune in tomorrow and find out. We'll see you then.